Ya hemos empezado rompiendo el hielo con, con estas cuestiones filosóficas de a qué dosis, mejora doble dosis una sola vez, mejora simple dosis cada 12 horas. Como veis, en CEBA estamos bastante enfocados a hacernos cuestiones científicas y si hay que darle la vuelta a los registros, pues se eh, lucha y se obtienen datos, el tema es poder trabajar con, con confianza. Así que en breve veréis revoluciones también que ayuden a llevarlo a la práctica. Y una de las eh, partes importantes para llevarlas a las prácticas son todos los estudios en los que ha participado como investigador Luca. Así que, so, Luca, please, you can start with your conference. So, again, I need to disclose my conflict of interest. I do have a, a consulting agreement with SIVA. Once again, I'm not um, uh, sort of uh, directed to what I'm going to say, but certainly something I need to disclose. And once again, I will try to use this um, app to collect your uh, answers and questions. So there will be the QR code to scan after or before each um, question. Right, so heart failure. We've been talking about heart failure earlier. We're talking about heart failure now. But we're going to approach it a little bit more um, um, uh, lateral approach. And um, as I said, nothing new for you, but certainly something that may um, stimulate some questions that can then be answered after this lecture or during the, um, the, the discussion at the end with uh, Pepa and, um, and Domingo. So there are several definitions of uh, heart failure. You can choose the one you prefer. I like simple things. So for me, heart failure is a condition where there is a, a pathology affecting the heart, a condition affecting the heart, whether it is a pathology of the myocardium or the valves or the gray vessel, doesn't matter. When the heart cannot produce a cardiac output that is sufficient to satisfy the metabolic demands of the tissues, that's for me heart failure. And uh, if you think about the majority of uh, metabolic demand in a, in a person having a normal lifestyle, then exercise intolerance will certainly be um, a very important issue because uh, there is not sufficient oxygen and nutrients pumped by the blood to the skeletal muscle to produce um, a proper muscular contraction. There are other mechanisms, of course, but just to give you an idea how we can uh, interpret heart failure. And um, as you have noticed here, I didn't say congestive heart failure. I deliberately said heart failure because uh, you can still have heart failure without congestion. And uh, the reason why we tend to say congestive heart failure in our patients is because uh, we often, as Domingo correctly said earlier, we may miss the initial signs. We may miss the lethargy, the exercise intolerance that can character characterize heart failure at the beginning. While in people, it will be easier because uh, the patient will go to the doctor complain about, for example, um, uh, the incapacity of walking upstairs without feeling short of breath. But all cases of heart failure will uh, follow pretty much this uh, behavior. This is a graph that comes from the brown wall, which is a human cardiology textbook. And, uh, and this explains why on the left side, the y-axis, we got the performance of the heart expressed as ejection fraction that we don't really use very much uh, in uh, veterinary medicine. We tend to use perhaps more fractional shortening. I don't use that either. Um, I just make my assessment on the visual appearance of, uh, of the heart, but regardless, Let's just assume that the y-axis is an indication of a heart function. And then on the x-axis, the horizontal line, we got the time. And if you notice, time in brackets says years, which is exactly like in our patients. If you think about majority of our patients, if you think about dog with mitral disease, that's a condition that is relatively benign to start with, and it carries on for years. And that's why we have such a long time on the x-axis. And the index event, the purple arrow, indicates the beginning of the disease. 
If it is a congenital disease, obviously the arrow will be on day zero when the patient is, um, um, comes to, to the world. A patient, a dog or a cat comes to the world after birth. But if it is an acquired condition like uh, mitral disease, then would be later in life. And that's the first drop of blood that goes back into the left atrium. So the beginning of mitral regurgitation would represent the index event. What happens? We mentioned some cardiac modeling earlier. So the heart will try to compensate, will try to adapt. And these yellow donuts that you can see on, uh, on this graph represents it's a sort of graphic representation of the cross-section of the left ventricle. And you can see that that changes during time. And then depending on the disease, could be a concentric hypertrophy, an eccentric hypertrophy, a mixed hypertrophy. It depends on the type of uh, condition. But regardless, you can see that as we move along the history, natural history of this patient, the performance of the heart drops. So yes, we do have remodeling. The heart is trying to um, uh, activate me compensatory mechanisms, but inevitably the heart will, uh, the heart condition will deteriorate. So the e efficiency of the heart drops. And um, so cardiac modeling is one compensatory mechanism, but don't forget the importance of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system and the sympathetic activation that will all be mechanisms that will try to revert the condition. Now, let's try to think from a, a natural point of view what the, uh, the, 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 the meaning of uh, activation of the RAS system could be, because it's all deleterious for our patients. But try to imagine a healthy patient an healthy human being, and uh, doing some work in the garden, they cut the finger, they start bleeding. And so the blood pressure will drop. The blood pressure will drop until you manage to fix the bleeding and stop the hemorrhage. So the body, what does it do? The body needs to maintain the blood pressure all the time because there are two organs that are depending on a critical blood pressure, the brain and the myocardium. Even the kidneys, but the kidneys are a little bit more resilient but brain and myocardium will immediately suffer. So all these interventions are designed for uh, acute circumstances like uh, an acute hemorrhage. So that's when the RAS activation, the sympathetic activation, do good to the body. But in, in a chronic situation like heart failure, this will only increase the workload of the heart. The intention is good, trying to maintain the blood pressure, but then the result is actually deleterious. And that's why, despite the compensatory mechanism, we got the progression of the disease and very often secondary damage, like the cardiac remodeling, certainly the fibrosis um, and, uh, and so on. So we do have a lot of problems. And that's why, during this time, we move from a, a condition that is called asymptomatic to a condition where they develop clinical signs and become symptomatic. And obviously, there is not a very precise moment when they become symptomatic. Also, we mentioned earlier when to open the umbrella, so sometimes it's individual um, decision to call them symptomatic. And um, so this is pretty much what happens in our patients. And um, the new classification of heart failure that comes from uh, the consensus on mitral disease number one um, is um, that was in uh, 2009, and that published 2009, that used a system that was already in use in uh, human medicine. So they just reinvented the wheel pretty much with this classification. But it's a good classification because uh, it moves only in one direction, which is the direction of the natural history of the disease. So you can only go forward, you can go backward, which is certainly more accurate than uh, the previous systems like the um, New York Heart Association system or the Isaac system. So they were certainly systems with a lot of uh, limitations. I like this one a lot. And um, so we got class A that in my opinion shouldn't even exist. Um, this is just a predisposition. So the patient may or may not develop the heart disease. So. I don't think it should be classified as a heart failure. But it's, um, it's got a meaning because uh, there are some patients like Cavalier King Charles Spaniels, for example, Dachshunds, that are predisposed to mitral disease and therefore they may need to be monitored more often. Um, and, uh, and therefore, in order to detect the presence of a murmur once the mitral valve starts leaking.
But then the phase B is when we do have the disease, in this case, mitral valve regurgitation, and uh, they decided to subdivide this in B1 and B2, where B1 is the disease without cardiac remodeling, and B2 is with cardiac remodeling, namely left atrial, left ventricle enlargement. Now, in humans, they don't have such a subclassification, so it's A, B, C, D. And that's where perhaps we get a little bit confused because uh, the so-called B2 is a very wide spectrum and there might be dogs that can already be in failure or there may be very, very mild conditions. So again, open to discussion. And as I said, we are not obliged to follow the guidelines. We, we, sh we would be silly not to, um, to consider them, but if we do have a very valid point, we should make that clear. And then we move to the stage C when they do have sim symptoms, they do have clinical signs, and then when these uh, clinical signs that are successfully managed with uh, medications um, don't respond to therapy anymore, then we call it refractory failure. We need additional interventions, and that's called stage D. Very difficult, um, in my opinion, very difficult um, uh, class to... Um, to, to, to describe because uh, it's based on a variety of different conditions. According to the new consensus, for example, it's primarily based on the dose of furosemide, while in reality you need to look at all the comorbidities and uh, complications you can have. Uh, it's a much more complex uh, situation than uh, the one described in this uh, publication. But it's a very good uh, piece of information that we can use as a guideline. But very rarely people think about the non-pharmacological management of heart failure. And uh, in humans, it's fundamental. It's like diabetes, you move to diabetes, and you're diagnosed with diabetes, don't start with insulin straight away. You do have a phase where you can manage the disease with, without medications. So what could be these uh, non-pharmacological interventions you would recommend in, uh, in your patients? I would say compliance is uh, fundamental. And uh, we're going to talk about compliance later during the discussion. And uh, there will be also discussion about communication, etc. But certainly compliance is uh, important. So what do, we, what do we do? And we've been doing this for uh, more than 10 years now. We spend a lot of time with the clients to explain what's going on and uh, to give the best advice about the management. And uh, very often, especially if it is the first diagnosis, your clients are clients that leave the room in a sort of panic status, and uh, they don't necessarily listen to what we say, so they need some uh, additional support, and we provide handouts. So these are documents that we try to update every time it's uh, needed, and they describe the, um, the condition, in this case we've got mitral valve disease, and what to do, what to expect, and so on. So you explain the thing, but then they can go home and read it again. Why do we do that? Because if they go online, they may find very good websites. There are several good websites that give uh, accurate information, but there are a lot of uh, websites, blogs in particular, they are extremely misleading. And you just need one crazy uh, person to post something um, wrong to you know, put uh, the health of that patient at risk if that recommendation is followed by the owner. So make sure that information is correct and, uh, and, uh, uh, and given to, to, the, to the clients. Diet, I was always very skeptical about diet, but we do know that um, a cardiac diet can help. Um, Omega-3 fatty acid supplementation can also help in reducing the onset of arrhythmias. And uh, it has been proven both in pre-symptomatic and symptomatic cases that a moderate reduction of uh, sodium in the diet can be beneficial. And uh, so I must say that I'm not, I don't dispense um, um, cardiac diets very often, and the reason is I don't want to sort of get into economic or financial competition with, uh, with the primary vet, but it would be probably a good idea to discuss this with, uh, with the carers. And um, the, um, the, the, the problem of cardiac diets at the beginning was the palatability, but now the food manufacturers, they have um, solved the problem. They use um, 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 palatability enhancers, 
and uh, so these diets are accepted quite nicely. The other thing we need to talk about, weight, and if we don't do it, they will Google it, and they, they will go and find a human uh, medicine, human cardiology websites when they talk about diet and so on, so they will come back with this question. So um, another question is uh, the weight control. You might be aware of the, something called the cardiac paradox. So in other words, in human cardiology, obesity can predispose to heart disease, but when once the heart disease has been diagnosed and is uh, causing problems, then it's better to be overweight. So people that are overweight do better than lean people. And something probably to do with the cardiac cachexia that ine inevitably kicks in at the end of the disease. And if you have extra padding, extra, extra weight, then they can be um, working like a, a reservoir of uh, um, energy for uh, dealing with um, the... Um, malabsorption and loss of appetite you can see at the end. So you don't want them too fat, in other words, but you don't want them too slim either. I was also very skeptical about the sodium control. I said that there is evidence in uh, at least two publications from Lisa Freeman, 15, 20 years ago, they've been published. And um, it is true that if you give a diuretic, a loop diuretic, you lose sodium. So you say, okay, they should take care of the excess of sodium. But it's not just the excretion. It has to be a perfect balance between intake and excretion. Because if we give a very salty food, then we um, basically sort of uh, um, make the diuretic intervention less efficient. And uh, it's true that we cannot provide the uresis 24-7. We can provide the uresis for a period of time, and then let a period of potassium, um, so the sodium intake, because uh, otherwise we risk to dehydrate the patient too much. And uh, the same applies, for example, to the angiotensin, uh, renin angiotensin dorsal system. We had this discussion in Chicago, and the human cardiologist said, you can't just stop completing the RAS system. You can't just block the sympathetic system. You need to leave some uh, uh, form of modulation, and that's why we should perhaps avoid um, high sodium diets to avoid the excessive intake and create a sort of gradient of sodium that has to go out rather than coming in. Now, there's probably something for people of my generation. When I was studying, the recommendation was to restrict water intake, and uh, this is no longer a, a recommendation. I think it would be unethical to leave a, a dog or a cat thirsty for, uh, for too long. So perhaps in the acute phase, they come in open mouth breathing. Yes, you can withdraw water, but then has to be reintroduced as soon as possible because it's part of the welfare. And um, exercise, again, I was taught when I was a, a, a student or a young vet that they need to have cage, cage rest or uh, exercise restriction. We don't do that anymore. Actually, we want these uh, dogs to exercise. Cats are a little bit more difficult because you can't really, well, some people do, but you can't really walk your cat on a lead and control the amount of exercise, unless you can play with a laser pointer. My, my cat goes mad for that. And um, so the reason why exercise is important because exercise promotes vasodilation, peripheral perfusion, but also will reduce the risk of muscle, skeletal muscle atrophy, which is part of the science in cardiac cachexia. So if they exercise, they will counteract this uh, um, uh, loss of um, um, skeletal muscle tissue. And then monitoring, also very important. We need to talk to these uh, um, carers, to these uh, owners, in order to persuade to come back for the examination. Think about the stage B2, for example. So we need to monitor to decide when to start diuretic, or B1, we need to decide when to start other drugs when they enter in B2. So unless you monitor on a regular basis, you can't catch the right moment to start that particular medication. We have mentioned the sleep and respiratory rate chart, so I'm not going to repeat that. And uh, also we should reassess the severity of the heart disease in order to understand what to expect next. In terms of exercise, and there are monitoring systems. I, I did develop um, a, 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 a test on the treadmill 
many years ago, but it's, um, it's not easy to replicate in practice, so it can be done perhaps in some academic institutions. But there is something very, very easy to do, which is called the six-minute walk test. So in other words, and this validate is a test that um, they do in people. It's uh, done on a regular basis. My son is a cardiac patient, and um, he does the exercise, um, the six-minute walk test. It's a long corridor in the hospital, and there is a little penguin, because he's only eight years old, so he's a pediatric cardiology patient. There are little penguins every 10 meters, so they count how many penguins he can touch in uh, six minutes. And uh, actually, some are penguins, some are... Um, different animals, but I remember the penguins very well. And you can do the same with the dog. You can uh, have uh, um, a known length, like a long corridor, if you have the luxury of that, or perhaps on the, on the street outside your practice, the distance between your practice and the news agent, unless there are traffic lights in between, that wouldn't work. So as long as they can walk <laughs> regularly, you can see how many times they can do it in six minutes. And you, perhaps you can instruct them to do it before coming in. So uh, the recheck is like, oh, the exercise capacity has increased or has decreased. It's um, um, not um, rocket science, but can certainly help understanding these uh, things. So that's the handout I was uh, mentioning earlier. And uh, you can go to my website and download them. They are all um, up to date with the information. You can change, the obviously, the logo. And um, some of my cardiology colleagues have requested this, but you go to the website, you just download them for free. We also mentioned the evidence-based medicine earlier, and obviously here I'm going to talk about evidence-based medicine, and when evidence-based medicine is not there because we don't have a study, or the study that's been run was not properly designed, which is less likely, but then uh, you need to use something else. You need to use your best experience, your best judgment, your best intention, and take into consideration what the client wants. So, talking about evidence-based medicine, what I'm telling you now, is it very low evidence, very high evidence, something in between? Is it working? Or uh, I think we tried yesterday, was it not working? Oh, yes. Very high. Thank you very much. That was probably... Yeah, high, low. Ah. I don't get offended, so uh, I mean, I appreciate... <laughs> I appreciate the 42% say, oh, if I say something different, we'll get stroppy. All right, so we move from very high to high. <laughs> oh, well. It's interesting because actually the evidence is very low. Because what I'm telling you today is my own opinion, an expert opinion, if you allow me to call myself expert, then uh, it would be relatively low in the pyramid of evidence, right? Where the highest level of evidence would be a meta-analysis or at least a, a randomized, multicentric, placebo-controlled, double-blinded uh, test that would be certainly the highest evidence we achieve these, these days. And that's the reason why, when there is no evidence, I would say, this is my opinion. So the evidence moves from there to there, okay? So don't um, uh, go around and say, oh, but Luca said this, and, um, and in front of my colleagues, and then I pass like an idiot. Uh, this is, when, I, when his presence is not there, I will acknowledge that. We've been through this, so you know how the game works. So we will try to um, find what the answer to these questions is every time. So we've done this game with uh, diuretics. Okay, so we need to take into consideration the rational, which is reducing the circulating volume of blood and invert the trend of uh, passage across the membrane of the capillaries from the interstitium, we need to encourage the movement of water from the interstitium to the vessel. So I'm not going to repeat the story of diuretics. We move to something called the, the Three Amigos. <laughs> have, you, have you seen the movie The Three Amigos? Oh, you're very young. It's a very old movie of John Landis, the same director that did uh, The Blues Brothers. It's hilarious. So if you haven't seen this, it's super, super funny. Anyway. The three amigos are ACE inhibitors, pimobendin, and spironolactin. 
Now, they can come as single tablets or they can come in combination. I don't know whether it's the same. I'm sure the Cardalis is the president. I don't know whether you've got the Fortecor Plus in these countries, which is Pimo Bendan and Benazepil together. Otherwise, you've got the Cardalis, which is Benazepil and Spirolactin. And I love the idea of combining drugs because the less drugs you have, the more, um, the higher the compliance in theory should be. Right, so let's start with the ACE inhibitors then. And uh, can you type a name of an ACE inhibitor or names of ACE inhibitors you know and see how many we've got in our, war, in, in our um, cupboard? Ramipril, certainly one. Enalapril, very good. Benazepril, Benazepril, Ramipril, Benazepril. All right. One seven three two nine three. Is it your telephone number? I, <laughs> is it a pretty lady passing me her telephone number? <laughs> Be careful, I might call you. Right, okay. So, yeah, Captopril. That, I was waiting for that. Lisinopril, very good. Excellent. You know there are, I think, at least 12, at least a dozen of ACE inhibitors in human medicine that you can consider. And uh, captopril was uh, used at the very beginning, I remember, before uh, the first launch of ACE inhibitors in the veterinary market. But that's what we got at the moment. We got, obviously, several brands, but we do have four types of ACE inhibitors licensed in uh, veterinary medicine. Enalapril, benazepril, ramipril, imidapril. Which one is better? I don't know. They should be pretty much the same in terms of efficacy. And uh, imidapril, the only difference is that it's in a liquid form. And, uh, but I notice that when I ask my clients whether they prefer, in dogs at least, they prefer liquid or tablets, they all prefer tablets. And um, obviously that depends on uh, individuals, of course. And ACE inhibitors, both in human medicine and in veterinary cardiology, have consistently shown a beneficial effect in uh, in um, patients with uh, congestive heart failure, certainly in dogs and cats, in, in dogs, uh, sorry, rather than cats, they've consistently proven this, uh, this effect. So it is indicated in all stages of heart failure, and that's why you will see ACE inhibitors in uh, all uh, different recommendations. So what is the rationale of my treatment? What result would I expect? It's not as easy as with forosomite. With forosomite, was like a a didactic textbook type of, um, of approach. With this one, it's a little bit more difficult. Obviously, if we give an ACE inhibitor, we inhibit ACE, hopefully, and we can have uh, more or less inhibition depending on a variety of factors, as John explained quite clearly in the first lecture. So if we inhibit ACE, angiotensin converting enzyme, we inhibit the production of angiotensin II, and uh, therefore uh, the cascade of angiotensin II and aldosterone release. And um, we also have an increased concentration of bradykinin because uh, one of the effects of uh, um, angiotensin II is the breakdown of uh, bradykinin. So if we have more bradykinin, we may have a potential anti-remodeling effect. Although we do have, because of the increased level of bradykinin, we've got another problem that is affecting approximately 25 to 30% of human patients. Do you know, not being reported in dogs, although we do see occasionally. Cough, very good. So cough is caused by the increased level of bradycani being a precursor of arachidonic acid and um, other uh, um, inflammatory leukotrienes, in particular inflammatory um, compounds that can predispose to coughing. And that's why they use a lot of uh, angiotensin to receptor agonists in human um, uh, in, because of uh, inhibition of, um, of ACE. So ACE is uh, responsible for uh, the breakdown of um, bradykinin. I said angiotensin II, but I meant ACE. Then um, with uh, activation of the angiotensin aldosterone system, we got also vasoconstriction um, and uh, activation of fibroblasts, we got fibrosis. So by inhibiting it, we should be able to promote vasodilation and fibrinolysis, and then obviously we want to reduce the preload by doing that and uh, reduce the um, incidence of pulmonary edema. 
So when added to diuretics, ACE inhibitors should provide the best uh, response in terms of improving clinical science, exercise intolerance, and survival. So the rationale of the treatment is uh, pretty good, but results, how would I expect the results? How can I, well, these are the results, but how can I monitor these uh, results? It's very difficult. It's not as easy as with furosemide. So we just need to interpret some changes after we give this medication, like the reduction of proteinuria if there is concomitant um, renal disease, the reduction of potassium loss, the improvement of exercise capacity, improvement of clinical signs. So it's a little bit subjective, so we don't have very strong ways to monitor the response. But also side effects we need to take into consideration. The potential dry cough, I will probably see this in... Um, maybe 1% of our patients, no, no more than that. And the reason why I know that, because uh, they start coughing after you start ACE inhibitors, you stop the ACE inhibitors, they stop coughing. You start the ACE inhibitors again, they start coughing again. At that point, I think it's enough evidence to say, well, probably we should avoid ACE inhibitors. And uh, hypotension is reported as a side effect, and actually is one of the very first drugs given to people with hypertension but we don't tend to see it. In a, personally, I've never seen an hypotensive patient following administration of um, um, uh, ACE inhibitors, whether we're giving the right dose or not, or the number of administrations, that's something uh, different. Angioedema is something, again, reported in people, but never seen in uh, dogs. So side effects are minimal, very safe drug, and uh, so they can be used um, without much... Um, um, without many concerns. So what is the scientific evidence to support my choice? That's the, the last question. Right, it depends on the type of patient. So let's start with dogs with um, symptomatic, uh, symptomatic disease, so dogs in heart failure. There are several studies, at least um, uh, two plus one acute response, so three studies, we're talking about at least 20 years ago, where the evidence is pretty high because there were um, controlled studies, placebo controlled with uh, uh, multicentric approach and um, double blinded. And um, the live study, certainly the first one was published by Steve Ettinger in uh, um, JAFMA, and uh, it showed an, an, an improvement of uh, survival in dogs that were receiving enalapril in combination with uh, furosemide compared to dogs that were with um, only furosemide. And these were dogs with uh, mitral regurgitation. Dogs with dilated cardiomyopathy did not obtain the statistical difference between treated and untreated dogs. And then we have the bench study, which used benazepril instead of enalapril. Again, same class of dogs, dogs with mitral disease, and dilated cardiomyopathy in congestive heart failure. And here they found, um, again, a, a statistical difference between dogs on benazepril compared to dogs without benazepril, but obviously taking furosemide. But again, not the same in the mitral regurgitation and in dilated cardiomyopathy. So they are different conditions, and that's probably why we got these different results. But these two studies were sufficient to indicate ACE inhibitors in all dogs with congestive heart failure. And then we had uh, another study was published um, a couple of years ago. It's called the VALVE trial. In the VALVE trial, they, in the same class of dogs, so dogs in, uh, with mitral valve disease and congestive heart failure, they, given the um, pimobendan, furosemide, and ACE inhibitor medication compared to pimobendan, ACE inhibitor, um, sorry, compared to the um, um, pimobendan and uh, furosemide alone. So just to see what the benefit of adding um, an ACE inhibitor would be. And uh, the kaplan meier curve in this uh, diagram shows that there is no a real beneficial effect. So interesting food for thought. Perhaps we should not give an alapril alone. And uh, that's why I'm talking about, I'm coming with this new question. What do you think is this uh, lack of consistent performance of ACE inhibitors in the long term in dogs with congestive heart failure? Do you think it's because there is a reduced bioavailability or reduced owner's compliance or a sympathetic activation or a dosterone escape? 
we got seven people that voted for aldosterone escape, nine, so I think we got a consensus here. Let's wait for another few, but nobody went for the others, which is good because uh, that's exactly the correct answer I was expecting. Unfortunately, the aldosterone escape is, uh, is a real issue. It's been um, well proven both in humans and, uh, and in dogs. And that's primarily caused by the capacity of other compounds to transform angiotensin, two, angiotensin 1 and angiotensin 2, bypassing the um, angiotensin converting enzyme. And this, primarily, this mechanism is caused by chymase, produced primarily by the mast cells in, um, in the liver. So this chymase can uh, convert angiotensin 1 and angiotensin 2. So you can have all the inhibition of the ACE, even completely 24-7, you can still have production of angiotensin 2. And obviously, this angiotensin 2 can still give the negative um, responses that we have mentioned earlier. That was in dogs. How about symptomatic cats? Do you use ACE inhibitors in cats at all? Never, sometimes, often, always? Ooh, that's, that's going to be interesting. Let's see this. Uh, Wow. Okay. So that's uh, pretty much. So majority would probably say often, sometimes, never, sometimes you see. But only 5% will always go for ACE inhibitors in cats. Let's see what the evidence is. Now, there is a, a relatively old study here, um, nearly 20 years old now, 15, 20 years old from uh, Chrissy McDonald, who was um, a PhD at that time at um, Davis, <coughs> California. And what they did, they treated Maine Coon um, um, cats. These were actually um, they were cats without heart failure. But I'm going to the heart failure in a second. But that was the very first report. And what they did, they did uh, MRI. Of, uh, of the heart of this main coon predisposed to um, congestive heart failure to um, natural development of uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And, um, and then they used tissue Doppler to assess the myocardial performance, and they didn't see any significant difference, actually. Given Ramipril or not, these cats wouldn't make any difference, but that's asymptomatic cats. There is a bigger study that was uh, run it's an interesting story. It was run more than 20 years ago when I was still working at Bristol University. And um, at that time, we tried to use benazepril in a cat with or without heart failure. And um, this is how the study was designed. We had um, 151 cats, so it's not a small study. It's relatively big. And uh, it was prospective, randomized, placebo control, multi-center, double-blinded. So all the perfect credentials to be a reliable study. The primary endpoint was uh, treatment failure, and the second endpoint was quality of life and some echocardiographic variables. And um, the results were available back in 2004, 2005, but we couldn't publish until um, two, three years ago. And that's because uh, we do not have control of the data. And then eventually, the drug company decided that this information should become available. And so it was eventually published in JVIM. But unfortunately, you see the result is not particularly appealing. Um, we didn't have any statistical difference between the cats on placebo and cats on benazepril. And therefore, there was um, uh, a relatively sad, sad outcome. It's not that I'm trying to have these drugs failing in cats. This is how it is. Cats are different patients, and they don't necessarily respond to um, these medications like dogs. OK, let's move to the second amigo, and that's pimobendin, which is a calcium sensitizer. And uh, so it is a nanotropic agent, but using um, different mechanisms compared to um, uh, like a digoxin, for example, or a selective um, phosphodiesterase inhibitors, 
no selective phosphodiase inhibitors, while the selective phosphodiesterase inhibition in Pimobenda seems to promote primarily vasodilation in the periphery rather than um, increase the contractility like mirinone, for example, would do at the level of the myocardium. So we get a positive anotropic effect, vasodilation, which is perfect. That's what we need in every patient with congestion. There's also a mild lusitropic effect, so many it improves the relaxation, which gave a lot of uh, hope for uh, treating cats in uh, congestive heart failure. And it can also have a mild platelet aggregation inhibition, which again could be beneficial in cats to reduce the risk of arterial thromboembolism. So the rationale is uh, uh, very simple, right? So we need to in we, we increase the stroke volume, and uh, for that reason, we increase the cardiac output. We promote visualization, so we reduce the afterload, and so we got all the better uh, performance, the best per performance of, uh, of the heart. So an ideal drug in this uh, respect. So what result would I expect? Again, very difficult to quantify the results with Pimobenda. It's a bit of an act of faith, like for ACE inhibitors. We don't have an objective way to measure the difference. Some people swear that they can, uh, on, on echocardiography, they can see differences. I've never really seen differences. I see clinical improvements, but no echocardiographic changes. So um, we based our assessment on improved clinical science, improved exercise capacity, increased appetite is something they, they keep reporting um, clients when they start Pimobenda. And uh, possible side effects, we do have probably, I would probably say, one or two dogs in a hundred that will vomit um, after the first administration of pimobendan. Normally we just stop it for a couple of days and then we start at a lower dose and then we go back to the original dose and problem is solved. And um, in theory, we should not use this medication for uh, outflow obstruction like an aortic stenosis, for example, because uh, it will potentially uh, increase the pressure gradient. Scientific evidence is uh, pretty high. We've got several studies available, and certainly we can use these uh, studies to support our decisions. Let's start with the symptomatic Doberman with DCM. And then here I've got a very strong opinion about DCM, which may or may not be shared by other people, but I think that unless it's a Doberman, I really doubt my diagnosis. You can see DCM phenotype in a variety of conditions. And normally when it comes to a Great Dane, for example, or Newfoundland, I always find something else that is responsible for volume overload. And therefore, or even an arrhythmia, atrial fibrillation in particular, that's typical in Irish Wolfhound. Is it real DCM or is it tachycardiomyopathy? So there are a lot of uh, questions. But when it comes to Dobermans, I'm a little bit more relaxed. So let's see, and, and you will see why I also say that. This is the, one of the earliest studies on um, Pimo Bender in um, Dobermans and Cocker Spaniel. So what they did, they had uh, Cocker Spaniel and Doberman with DCM in congestive heart failure, and uh, they added Pimo Bender or placebo to treatment. And they found in the upper graph a significant in improvement of life expectancy in Dobermans, but they didn't find any response in Cocker Spaniel. So why is that? Are they Cocker Spaniels um, stronger than Dobermans? Because they live much longer. If you look at the graph, they live for years. Or we were treating something that wasn't DCM. That's my interpretation. I don't think that in Cocker Spaniels you see very often either athletic hearts that look like DCM or I see uh, evidence of a uh, um, AV valve dysplasia, which can be responsible for that. But anyway, as I said, this is my interpretation. Then we got a, a, a second study done by Michael Grady, who spent his entire career on DCM in Dobermans, and he sort of replicated the same results that Virginia Luis Fuentes and, um, and colleagues found in uh, Edinburgh. But then, interestingly, we had the uh, publication of the PROTECT study, to assess the asymptomatic effect, the, the effect of pimobendin in the asymptomatic DCM dogs, or a cold DCM. And um, again, we had a positive effect, even in asymptomatic dogs. So dogs, Dobermans, they receive pimobendin in the asymptomatic phase, or phase B2, or a cold cardiomyopathy. They tend to do better than dogs that receive placebo instead. And um, so this was the very, in my opinion, 
as far as I know, the very first report of a drug that would work in asymptomatic dogs and uh, certainly was a, a revolutionary discovery. But when it comes to symptomatic dogs with mitral valve disease, the study that we refer to is called the Quest study, again published approximately 20 years ago now. And um, you can see that these were dogs with mitral valve disease and congestive heart failure that were treated either with benazepril or pimobendan uh, in combination with furosemide. Unfortunately, this study here sort of created a lot of issues in the future because, um, okay, why not um, benazepil in both groups plus or minus pimobenda? That would be much more interesting. So we could have done the valve study uh, 20 years ago, but they decided to do it this way, and uh, so it was a, con a positive control in favor of pimobenda. So we can um, see certainly the beneficial effect of pimobenda. But then we got also the asymptomatic dogs, and we got the EPIC study, which, um, again, was designed for dogs in mitral valve disease, but without signs of congestive heart failure. And then uh, they were receiving either placebo or uh, pimobendan, and then uh, the end point was the development of uh, congestive heart failure or cardiac death. But, um, again, certainly in favor of uh, pimobendan. This, again, changed completely the approach because... Uh, from, uh, from this point, we, st we started giving pimobendan also to asymptomatic patients. So this was the second proof that we can do something to um, slow down the progression of the disease before the onset of clinical signs. How about cats? Do you use pimobendan in cats with congestive heart failure? Always. Sometimes, okay, I know I've got a very strong group of followers, so 20, 20 followers, they're always there. The others are not engaged or they got a flat battery on their phone. Sometimes, followed by often, never, always went down to, started well, but then went to 10%. Well, Pimo in cats is difficult um, to administer. First of all, it's not licensed, so difficult to justify. And second, we know very little um, about the pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamics of, uh, of Pimo in cats. Although there is a study from uh, um, uh, Borgarelli's group um, quite a few years ago now about the pharmacokinetics of oral Pimo and you can see from, uh, from this graph that they got a very rapid absorption of pimobendan much faster than in dogs by much slower elimination. Therefore, it means that the pharmacokinetics is different from dogs. So which dose should we use? How often should we use? We don't have any information about that. So again, we use the approach, a cat like a small dog, we treat a cat like we would treat a chihuahua, for example. But then when it comes to the symptomatic cat, um, with um, um, congestive heart failure, then we got sort of very weak evidence. We got several studies, primarily were retrospective study, and the only real answer of this study was, yeah, it seems to be a safe drug in cats. But they never did a proper um, study on uh, the survival. Even this one, there was, a, yes, a, a retrospective study, but um, sort of um, controlled in terms of um, uh, groups of, uh, of treatments. They seem to have something in favor of Pimobena, which is the gray line compared to the white line, but the real evidence came from, uh, from this study from uh, Carson Schoburn, uh, Ohio State University. And um, yeah, you can see that Pimobena in cats doesn't seem to do any, anything, right? So the survival is uh, exactly the same. So Anecdotally, and anecdotally, <laughs> seems like a good, um, uh, a good drug to use, but the reality is this one. And uh, we can discuss perhaps later, because I, I do use pimobendan occasionally, but more for an emotional response than a scientific approach. Now, let's move to the third amigo, the spirolactone. Spirolactone is a super interesting drug. And um, in, uh, in people, um, Spironolactone has shown to reduce the mortality rate 
by 30% in patients with advanced, um, advanced heart failure. And uh, the mechanism could be well, called mild diuretic effect, as we saw earlier today, but primarily is the um, counteraction of the negative effects of aldosterone, primarily in terms of uh, remodeling. You know that uh, uh, aldosterone can uh, promote the activation of fibroblasts and uh, the position of um, fibrous tissue in the myocardium. So if we can avoid that by using a, a, an inhibitor, we can perhaps have a better outcome. And uh, spironolactone is available as uh, pure spironolactone or as a combination with uh, an ACE inhibitor, benazepil, namely. So what is the rationale of my treatment? As I said, inhibition of aldosterone, which uh, is due to the competition for uh, the receptors in the cortical collecting duct, and that's where the aldosterone is still around, but it cannot interact with this receptor, so it doesn't give the biological effect. And therefore, we got the opposite effect. We got reabsorption of, um, um, or reduced secretion, if you say, of uh, potassium, and uh, elimination of uh, sodium and water will, uh, uh, will follow. That's why it's got a mild diuretic effect as well. And then uh, it, um, it also prevents the, um, the um, remodeling by reducing the myocardial fibrosis, as I said. How can we monitor the response? Uh, again, I think that for me, an easy way to do it is to control the potassium level. If potassium level is restored after um, administration of spironolactone, that means that uh, it's, uh, it's working. Synergist synergistic effect with furosemide is a big question mark. They have proven that in uh, normal healthy dogs, but as I said before, you cannot use normal dogs as models for a heart failure. So the opposite has never been um, confirmed. So it's a um, question mark. Side effects, hyperkalemia reported in people when in combination with ACE inhibitors, but we don't tend to see it. So it's uh, something that is uh, perhaps um, an issue, but maybe it's not. Prostatic hypoplasia was reported by SIVA during uh, um, the, um, the clinical study, and uh, which could be, in male dogs, could be actually a, a, a good effect rather than a side effect, because hyperplasia is um, quite nasty at times. Skin lesions have been reported in cats. We're going to talk about that. And uh, muscle weakness, GI bleeding, is something I've never seen. It's reported in people, but not in, um, not in dogs and cats. So what is the scientific evidence to support my choice? Well, we got a randomized control, placebo control study, multicenter, in dogs with um, mitral valve disease stage C. It's called the Bernays study because it's the first author and that's the efficacy of spironolactone in uh, dogs with um, congestive heart failure. You can see the Kaplan-Meier there on the top. There is um, certainly a positive effect in favor of uh, spironolactone in terms of survival. But you may notice here, and that's, um, I think, one limitation of this study, that the 50% mortality has never been reached in this study. So I believe this was a very mild population, um, or a population of dogs with very mild disease, to the point that not all dogs were on furosemide. So that means that perhaps there were a lot of C2, and B2 rather than C, in this study. And also the inclusion criteria are dangerous, not dangerous, are misleading. And the reason is that you need, you need for uh, the inclusion in the study to have at least cough, dizziness, syncope, or decreased mobility, altered demeanor, at least one of the two in, in both columns, but three in total. So it was um, uh, a condition where if you have um, a Yorkshire Terrier, 12 years old, 12, 12 year old um, Yorkshire Terrier with um, arthritis, and tracheal collapse uh, would be eligible because it would be altered demeanor, decreased mobility, and uh, cough. There we go. So it doesn't mean that that patient is in heart failure. But apart from these uh, limitations, obviously, if we go back to the kaplan Mayer, we can see that the diversion is pretty obvious and is very convincing. Therefore, even if it's not a perfect study, we can still um, sort of predict that um, 
um, this uh, drug, spirulactone, in dogs in heart failure would be beneficial. And then uh, in the... Uh, that's a, sorry, that's another study was already excited to talk about the delay study. But there's a, a more recent study where they combined the um, benazepine with spironolactone. They found that there is a, certainly a beneficial effect in favor of the addition of spironolactone in dogs that are treated with um, furosemide and, uh, and benazepine. So that's another interesting paper and in favor of spironolactone. So I said I was very excited because I've been actively involved with the delay study. So I was uh, really rushing to, to tell you about my uh, opinions about this study. So this is the equivalent of the EPIC study, but instead of using pimobendon, we use the combination of uh, benazepil and spironolactin given once a day. And uh, the kaplan mayer there is um, a little bit disappointed because there are two identical curves pretty much. And so the median survival is the same for um, dogs with pimobendon, um, with spironolactin um, and benazepil and dogs on uh, placebo. So as a primary endpoint, which was um, obviously like um, uh, in the EPIC studies, the development of congestive heart failure primarily and cardiac death obviously will be another endpoint. The, the result was um, disappointing. But do you use ACE inhibitors and spironolactone in dogs with uh, much of a disease in stage B2 despite that result? And some people said the negative result. And then Michele Borgarelli was the, the leader of the study, gets very upset when they say negative result. No, they're not negative results. They're called neutral results. So, because a, a negative result would be that you give spironolactone and benazepine and they do worse. But they didn't do worse, they did the same. So it's a neutral um, type of response. Right, so it depends on the case. 52% never, sometimes, often, always. Okay, I like that because that is exactly my approach. It depends on the case. And the reason is that we need to look at the secondary endpoints as well. And uh, otherwise, we shouldn't even mention the secondary endpoints in a, in a study. And in the delay study, the secondary endpoint was primarily echocardiographic variables, radiographic variables, and uh, um, biochemical changes and so on. So if we look at the secondary endpoints here, I need to wear my glasses because I can't read. We got heart rate in the first image. Now, the red is uh, um, the group of dogs on placebo, while the blue is dogs on uh, um, combined spironolactone benazepine. So these are all significant differences, and the heart rate increases without medication, and uh, tends to actually decrease a little bit with uh, spironolactone and benazepine. Now, heart rate is important because it's an expression of the activation of the sympathetic system. So it's something that we need to consider, as well as the vertebral heart score, although the difference here is minimal because we're going from 11.3 to 11.6. So I don't get too excited about that, but it came out as a significant difference. Now, LA2 aorta, so which is uh, the bread and butter, that's how we... Uh, judge the severity of these cases, actually, we had the reverse remodeling. So these uh, left atrium, the left atrium of dogs on uh, benazepine spironolactin had um, a reduction of the left atrium size compared to the dogs on placebo they actually kept progressing in their remodeling. And the same is the EPIC of the mitral inflow, because again, this gives uh, an indication of, of course, the pressure in the left atrium, but also the um, uh, the restrictive pattern that can be associated with uh, the advancement of the disease. And again, one another important echocardiography parameter in favor of uh, spironolactone and benazepine. And then we can carry on the left ventricular external diameter, uh, le uh, sorry, uh, left ventricular internal diameter at the end of diastole normalized in favor of the medication. And um, yeah, so that's why I use. Um, but this is me, right? It's not scientific. Actually. I use this combination in dogs in mitral valve B2 when I can see um, the criteria where in this study, 
we had uh, the most likely onset of heart failure in the following months, which I mentioned earlier is LVDD normalized more than 1.9, LH aorta more than 2.1, and in any way more than one meter per second. In theory, also NT pro BMP is higher than 1500 picomoles per liter. So that's my approach. And uh, so you see, I'm in theory, I'm going against the guidelines, I'm going against the consensus, but first of all, this was not published before the consensus, it was published after, and, uh, and so it doesn't mean that I need to agree with everyone at all times. When it comes to CAT with uh, congestive heart failure, there is an interesting study, which was just a pilot study called the CISICAT, where they gave um, spironolactone in CATs in heart failure, uh, they were ov obviously receiving the furosemide at the same time. And they found that cats receiving spironolactone had an increased life expectancy compared to cats not receiving spironolactone. The problem is that this was a small study and uh, they had uh, 20 cats in total. And the, unfortunately, the randomization, which is a lottery, of course, that's why it's called randomization, didn't go well. In other words, cats who were receiving spironolactone had a much milder disease than cats who were not receiving spironolactone. So they were treating two different populations of dogs. There was a, a, an accident. I mean, it depends on you know, the, the, the probabilities. And uh, with the biggest studies, probably that wouldn't have happened. But that, that's what um, they found here. So certainly uh, an interesting result in favor of spironolactone, we should probably hint, hint for a SIVA, we should probably run again this study with a, a bigger and better controlled um, randomization, because I think at the moment we don't have anything in cats that can work, so we need something, and I think this, this could be potentially the drug that make, can make the difference in cats. And then um, I mentioned something earlier, and I was going to visit it now, which is the use of um, um, spironolactone in uh, cats um, with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and, but without congestive heart failure. And again, this is a study from Christy McDonald using the same colony of Maine Coon cats with hypertrophic uh, cardiomyopathy. And um, they didn't find any difference in uh, terms of uh, myocardial mass on uh, magnetic resonance or in diastolic performance um, in uh, cats receiving spironolactone. And what they found instead, that one cat in three approximately developed ulcers, facial pruritus, and then ulcers, which I've never seen. I use spironolactone in cats a lot, and I've never seen this problem. So I don't know whether that particular colony of Maine Coons was, uh, had a sort of idiosyncrasy for spironolactone, or perhaps the batch of spironolactone they used was uh, uh, not perfect. There was a, an issue with that particular batch, but something that I've never heard um, when I talk to, to my colleagues. This is a picture that the general practitioner sent me, and uh, he claimed was a spironolactone-induced um, um, skin ulcer, but I, I cannot prove it. So that's what we would expect to see, but we don't see very often. And it would be nice to know whether you have experience. And uh, yeah, and so that is um, pretty much the end of my gallery on uh, how to treat heart failure in dogs and cats. And I'm sure there will be a lot of questions coming soon. Thank you very much.